All right, welcome back. Well, in this video, we're going to continue our discussion on sequences, and we're going to talk about what bounded sequences are and how to show that a sequence is bounded, and also how we can manipulate sequences algebraically, like justifying whether or not it's possible to add two sequences together, multiply them, and that kind of thing. So we'll start with our definition. A sequence is bounded, essentially, if there exists a number such that the absolute value of your sequence is less than m for all natural numbers n. Okay, remembering that a sequence is just an ordered set of numbers um, indexed by the natural numbers. So what does this mean? Well first off we'll just express the um, natural number, sorry, the absolute value of xn being less than m in its full form. Obviously we know that's equivalent to negative m being less than xn being less than m. So if we were to draw our sequence on the number line here, so here are our natural numbers along here, 1, 2, 3, etc. Then our sequence values, we could plot with circles on the graph. Pen's working now, so we'll plot them like this. So this could be a, a sequence, um, oh, and it goes, a lot of values. Now the definition says that our sequence is bounded if we can find a number m such that our value, the items in the sequence or the terms in the sequence are between negative m and m. So we could draw that on our picture as just being, for example, here. So these are equidistant from the origin. So this would be m and this would be negative m here. And so the, the definition of a bounded sequence is just that all of the terms of the sequence fit between those two numbers, negative m and m. All right, and it doesn't matter exactly what m is. So if this is one bound, it's just an existence property. So we could equally well find another, another value here, which is higher up. If we could find any value m, this could be another possibility for m and negative m. If we can find any m satisfying this condition so that all of the terms are sequence lie between those two values, then we, sh we can say that the sequence is bounded. All right, so here's a theorem about convergent sequences. It, we can show that every convergent sequence is in fact a bounded sequence as well. All right, so how's this going to work? Well, let's sort of outline the strategy for our proof here before we go and prove it. So remembering that we have a sequence whose limit uh, so let me say that again. We've got a sequence that's convergent. When we're going to prove this thing, we've got to make use of that information so, um, somehow. So if we were to sketch a picture of what our convergent sequence looks like, definition of convergence says that given any particular epsilon, once you go far enough across to the right, all of your terms will fit within epsilon of some limit. Okay, and also when we've got a convergent sequence, it also has a limit. So let's just start off Start off by defining what that limit is. So let xn be a sequence whose limit is L. We know it's convergent, so we can define its limit. Um, so if it's just that in, on our picture, L would be somewhere around about here, I guess. Now, we know that for every choice of epsilon, we can find a natural number n such that beyond that point, every term fits in a band of size no greater than epsilon around L. So what the way this is going to work is we're going to choose an epsilon. So I'm just going to make it, I know, this big. Right, so this would be L minus epsilon here, L plus epsilon here. And you see that if we go far enough across, okay, the our definition of convergent sequences says we can find um, ourselves a number n here, such that if we go any further to the right, all of these points fit within that band. So let's just shade that in the, the way that we sometimes do. So let's just take stock of what we've been given. The fact that it's convergent gives us this, 
Our choice of epsilon then gives us this n here. That's what our convergent definition tells us we can have. Now we're trying to find a number that bounds the entire sequence. Okay, so what we want is to make sure that every term in the sequence is between negative and positive of a particular number. So how could we do that? Well, here's where it gets interesting. So we have, before this natural number n here, we have finitely many terms in our sequence. All right, so there they go up from 1 to n minus 1. There are finitely many of these, and so we know that, um, and the thing is, is we know what size all of these terms have. So if we want to look at the magnitude of these terms, they have values, absolute value of x1, absolute value of x2, up to absolute value of x n minus 1. That's the size of the first n minus 1 terms of my sequence. So when I'm trying to choose a candidate value for the bound, one thing I could do is I could look at the maximum of this set of numbers. And we can see that if we take the biggest one of these, everything else is going to be smaller in magnitude than the largest one. So we have that x i will be less than or equal to this number. for all i in 1 to n minus 1. Okay, so that's good, but it's not quite enough. It does sort out the first n minus 1 terms, but then we have to look at what's going on beyond here. Well, the good news is, beyond this, we know how big these terms are. We know that we're within QE of L, so perhaps we should just take the absolute value of L Okay, so we've got to think about this for a second. So looking at this picture, why don't we just make a concrete choice of epsilon? Instead of calling it epsilon, we'll just say 1. Um, remove that. So I'm just going to take the epsilons out. I'm going to choose a particular value just for sake of argument. I'm going to make it L plus 1 and L minus 1. Okay, so L, if L is a positive number, then the largest these could be would be L plus 1. But we just need to be a little bit careful because we, we might just append at that point in time, we might just take our list and just add L plus 1 to it. And if L were a positive number, then that would actually be enough. That would give us our bound. However, L could be a negative number. And if L were negative, L plus 1 is going to be on the wrong side. So if L was a negative number down here, L plus 1 would be here. So L minus 1 would be the thing we're interested in. So rather than having L plus 1, we should make it the absolute value of L plus 1 as being our additional thing to consider. That way, if L is a negative number, it gets translated to being a positive number first and then gets 1 added to it. Now, every single term of the sequence is actually going to be less than or equal to this set of values if we include the absolute value of L plus 1. So that actually constitutes a proof. Um, so the last thing we need to do is just to write it in tidy language. So we have to, we've chosen this value 1 here as our choice of an arbitrary epsilon. We've got n as a result of that, and then we've worked from there. So we know that there is a, re there is a net. natural number n such that if n is greater than or equal to n, then the absolute value of x n minus l is less than 1. Okay, so remember 1 was our arbitrary choice of epsilon. So 1 is just convenient, we could have chosen anything else we liked, but 1 seems kind of tidy. This implies that the absolute value of xn is less than 
L plus 1. Okay, that's fairly easy to demonstrate from the previous one, so I'm not going to expand that out into any detail. So now we have to define our set that we talked about down here. So we'll let M be the set, or sorry, the maximum value of this set, x1 through to xn minus 1, and also L plus 1. It follows that the absolute value of xn is less than or equal to m for all n in the natural numbers. And thus, our sequence xn is bounded. All right, so every time we have a convergent sequence, we also know that it's bounded because of this finitely many terms before we get within a size that we can specify. And the final thing that I want to talk about in this video is the so-called algebraic limit theorem for sequences. Now this is a theorem that just justifies the various algebra algebraic operations that we might like to perform on our sequences. So we've got two sequences, Sn and Tn, and they converge, so we have limit values S and T for these two sequences. Now the, the algebraic limit theorem gives us four results that we can freely use once, the, once it's been proved. First is that the sequence Sn plus Tn, where we add the sequences term-wise, also converges, and the limit is what you'd expect. It converges to S plus T. Similar, similarly, if we take the sequence Sn and multiply every term by the same constant, then the sequence, the resulting sequence Ksn also converges and has the limit that you'd expect Ks. Products work, maybe slightly less obvious. Um, if we take products pairwise, then the sequence converges with limit st, and quotients also converge with limit s over t, with the caveat that t, the sequence tn cannot be converging to zero, otherwise our sequence will not converge. Okay, I'm not going to prove it in this video because it's getting quite long already, but in a separate video we'll prove each one of these, and then from then on we can freely use these algebraic operations that we'd like to use on sequences, knowing that they're fully justified.